This week, I am finishing Philippians. We ended with doing verse 7, and there was in the first section a piece where Paul speaks, and he says in the beginning parts of chapter 4, he was departing, and he said, these two ladies that are quarreling, they've been with me in the fray from the very beginning. Please, will you, to the elders that remain, will you help them sort this out because they are co-laborers in the faith. For whatever reason, they've got stuck. Help them. And so after that, preach the message saying, bear one another's burdens, suggesting that those burdens are not necessarily when somebody doesn't have food in their house that you go give it, but that person that annoys the living daylights out of you, that you lay your life down for them and you love them even more so. And that when we need to resolve issues, how do we do it? We go one-on-one. We discuss with each other. We try to win and not one coffee date. I'm always surprised how I would ask, have you been there? They say, yeah, I've done that. How many times? They go, once. One should be good enough. And I think, how many times have I sat in front of you? Ten times? hundred times? And then I also go, Lord, surely. Surely. And then he goes, more, more. So we saw that there was one-on-one, -on -one, then we go, and we, if we really get stuck, we get in somebody else to assist. And eventually, if we really can't win, we bring in leadership of the church to be able to facilitate. And this is really important. It's a beautiful thing to be able to do. And what I've noticed is that when we start to apply the Bible, it responds, doesn't it? And it brings life change to us. At first, it brings pain. Surely it must, because something has to die. Who knows what that is? <laughs> Absolutely. I might be wrong. Oh, dear. Adjust. So we continue in this journey in uh, Philippians, and we are ending it today, covering chapters 4, verses 8 to 23. And it reads as follows. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true, and honorable, and right, and pure, and lovely, and admirable. Think about things that are excellent, worthy of praise. Keep putting into practice all you learned and received from me, everything you heard from me and saw me doing. Then the God of peace will be with you. Isn't that interesting? Have you noticed that? What's that last sentence start with? So that indicates conditional, doesn't it? So many of us are expecting love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, that it's just something that you feel. Mm. And it's available to us, but what it's actually saying is, consider what you should be busy with. When we obey God, you know, there's this thing about the laws, do not do this, do that. Then there's the principles that actually bring life. So it's not necessarily laws like do not kill, but it's saying the ways of my kingdom look like this. And the ones that walk in the ways of my kingdom benefit from them. You can live however you want to, but don't expect an outcome equal to my kingdom if it's not in the ways of my kingdom. So I'd like to highlight some of these things that it calls us to focus on. And it's really Focusing on the playground of our mind, isn't it? Where are your thoughts? And in today's day and age, our minds are constantly bombarded and contaminated. And I'd suggest to such a degree that even those in the church don't know what truth is and what a lie is. Keith, that's very harsh. How can you say that? Obviously, I'm generalizing. I'm not talking about you. You are God's perfect specimen to everybody. Thank you for gracing us with your presence. So for everybody else, the evidence of God's dealings in our life has a result. And what you and I often do is we look at what we can do, and when somebody says, I don't think it reflects God, we get offended, don't we? But how can you get offended when it's not you? Surely the Spirit of God working through you and I, reproducing something that is a result that's pleasing to Him, has got nothing to do with you and I, has it? 
So Romans 12.2 says this to us. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person. Whose work is that? God's. When you look in the mirror, who do you put the pressure on? Me, 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 me. So Keith, well, surely this isn't just all God's thing. Come on now, surely I have to do some work. Yes, of course. You must let him do the work. But what we do is we look at the Bible, we see what we have to do, and we go, okay, cool. I'll forgive you, Jeanette. (laughs) Is it only me that's ever done that? All right. So what I do is, there's an expression that I've learned, which is, what do you need? Now, obviously, people that are very disciplined, ordered, and structured, when they hear that, they want to sometimes vomit, because what they think I mean is, have a spa day. What do you need? Put your feet up. Relax. Some me time. (sighs) Not referring to that. The question is, what do you need from God to be able to do what the Bible asks you? That's what I mean. That's what the Bible means. So when I need to do something that I cannot do, it is to get from God what I need, which would mean in the case of Jeanette, who has done absolutely nothing, just so that you know, I would be able to get to God and he gives me the love and he reminds me that I too am one with sin, that I am not faultless and God has forgiven me in spite of me because of who he is. And he who has been forgiven much, loveth much. And now I go with tears in my eyes and I say, Jeanette, I forgive you. She goes, thank you. Hopefully. (laughs) But if she doesn't, what I have, I have already attained. And the person that does not forgive me cannot take that away. And I move for empathy because they are trapped and I can intercede and pray for them that the forgiveness I have received, the freedom that I now walk in, that they too might have it also. So to be able to do that, what it's talking about is getting God to transform us. Then he would transform you and I into a new person by changing the way that we think. That's our responsibility. God's given us the things to meditate on and to do, but we have to decide Will we do them? So I'll just read it. Don't copy the behavior and the customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you. Then you will learn to know God's will for you. Most of us are trying to start at the end. What is God's will for me? But I'm not allowing him to transform my mind. So I cannot attain the will. Now when I say to people, you must listen to what the Holy Spirit tells you to do. What they are interpreting me saying is through broken emotions, negatives, feelings, and vibes. The Spirit of God I'm speaking to is the one that the Bible speaks of. Not the one that you and I might have experienced and have heard misquoted about. And people that have said, do this, and then it isn't that. I'm talking about the infallible spirit of God that has been tasked to tell us what we need to do. So what are these things that are in that first portion? It says, fix your eyes on what is true. And I'd want to suggest to us this morning is, all of us have got opinions. Ah, I don't think it means that. I think it means this. That's nonsense. Let's start to look at scripture from God's perspective. How does your opinion or your reflection on scripture actually bring glory to God? I've heard people quote, and then all the time I look in the undercurrent, and what it is, is it's loyal to me, or it's loyal to my friend, or it's loyal to my cause. Those are nonsense. He is only loyal to himself because in him is the source of all life. Everything you and I are involved in are offshoots of that. But if they move into the position of primary, it becomes idolatry. And then even that which you are busy with, which might be in his name, he will destroy. Because he's holy. He will not contend with us. Isaiah 55, 8 to 9. My thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, says the Lord. And my ways are far beyond anything you could imagine. For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, 
and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. That's God speaking. So in this context for us, it is pertinent, it is expected even, that when we're reading his word, when we're considering what we're wanting to do, is it what God means? The next thing is honorable. This is something of a godly character. Proverbs 22.4 reads, True humility and fear of the Lord leads to riches, honor, and long life. So when we would look to try and be honorable, what does it actually mean? It is the result of something. It is not the focus of something. I want to be honorable. What does that mean? I would suggest scripture is implying here that it is a person who is conducting themselves in a humble manner and their highest priority is what pleases God, which in turn is the evidence of somebody that fears God. And this comes with it, riches, honor, and long life. Second thing is think on what's right and pure. This is righteous living, purity. John 16, 8 reads, And when he comes, he will convict the world of its sin and of righteousness and of the coming judgment. So there's something of this that when we're walking in this way and we're choosing to focus on the things that please him, we come into partnership with the very spirit that will conduct these. That when we're standing with somebody, they're convicted of their sin. Why? Because they're standing in the presence of somebody that is in agreement with God. Not by word, but by heart. And in heart agreement, the Spirit of God is present. This is very important. A lot of us assume we have the Holy Spirit, but the conduct that requires for the Holy Spirit to be upon us with power, I'm suggesting we're not there yet. Because if we did, we would have the evidence of it. You know, we can't preach the gospel with satellite TV, supersonic jets, and Elon Musk's internet. To the same degree that an apostle did in a pair of flip-flops and took all of Asia. You want the better connection? It is him who empowers us to do us. There is no other way. He might use all of those things I just mentioned, but they are outlets. They are not sources. Lovely and honorable. Look for the good in people. Him and I tell you, I thank God for an appointment that I had with Brian many years ago. Because this stature comes with intimidation. It, it is for the purpose of advancing God's kingdom with authority and power. That when the enemy stands up in your life and mine, we kick it down, we take that authority because it's been given to us. But now if it's in pride and arrogance like I had to a much larger degree than today, because I believe it's still there, is uh, I wanted to sort some people out because their conduct was really miserable, and he, in his wisdom, took out a Bible from his desk drawer, threw it on the table, and he said, if you can show me how Jesus did like that, I'll follow you. So I wish I could tell you at that moment, I was cut to the heart, and I was humbled. I thought, cool, take that Bible. Let's go find these. I don't know how long it was. I think it was a couple of months that I realized there is a way to do this. And I started to see how Peter in his arrogance, God was just peaceful with him. Jesus said to him what he needed to say. And when he shook and did all the things that he did, Jesus was unfazed. Start to look for the good in people. The misery that you identify they have, trust me, they're already suffering for it. They don't need your godly eye on it. That's already happening. So the best that you can do is partner with God in the nuggets that you see in them. And I promise you, as your heart warms to those things that's good in them, they will start opening up the sides of themselves to you that they don't want you to go to. Why? Because through that, they feel the acceptance of love that there is for them. And you can too become a vessel of honor in that space that they don't have yet. Well, that's just what I learned anyway. So Hebrews 3.13 encourages us by saying, but encourage one another daily as long as it's called today. That sets the bar, doesn't it? 
for the 30 minutes, for the 45 minutes, and then they go, oh, thank goodness. I don't have to see them for another week. No. Today, all day. So that none of you, this is very important, eh? Check this. Because in me laying my life down like this and getting from God, as I said before, the love that I need for somebody bearing with one of their burdens, it says, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. It's, you and I have to start grasping the reality that this battle is not against flesh and blood, but against powers, principalities, and rulers of the air. What that does not mean is when the person comes into agreement with it, we don't address it. Jesus did. Get there behind me, Satan. But when you and I say it in the flesh, what we do is we rebuke the person to death. What Jesus did is he rebuked Peter for his preferred future. You can only do that if your heart is aligned with the person's best interest, which is what is God's preferred future for them? Other things to think on, excellent and worthy of praise. Encouraging and uplifting of God, others and self. Take a look at Psalms 63, 3 to 4. Your unfailing love is better than life itself. How I praise you. I will praise you as long as I live, lifting up my hands to you in prayer. This is a focused heart of adoration to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. If you and I get distracted by somebody else, we cannot profess that scripture. I would almost say, take this. Some people have got stickers all over their house for scriptures for the day. And most of them are probably like uh, Jehovah Jireh, my provider. Uh, all the things that we, that, we, that we focus on that are necessary in our lives. I'd want to say, put this one out front first. That when you would measure your heart's response, does it echo that adoration, that softness, that when you declare your unfailing love is better than life itself? Or do you, when you say it, does it feel like you, you got something bitter in your mouth? And when that happens, what you realize is your flesh has corrupted your heavenly taste buds. And so whatever you're asking for, whatever is cluttering your mind, I would suggest that you start saying, flesh, now we praise him. Flesh, now we exalt the name that is above every other name. Do you know that as you stand here and you're feeling miserable, your flesh is like a warm cloak, but it's leading to your death and destruction. Jesus, you're, and you start to praise him. Let him be Lord in that moment. And by doing so, the final word that Paul speaks of here is he says, practice it. Practice it. It doesn't come via osmosis. If you want me to lay hands on you, I can pray for you in your willing obedience to allow the Spirit of God to journey with you. But you must practice it. The first thing that happens is you climb in the car and, and, and something happens that the offense comes and you exchange the Spirit of God for the Spirit of death. Because that's all that reproduces. Doesn't sowing to the flesh reproduce what? And it reproduces death. So I'll just cut to the end for you. It's more dramatic that way. <laughs> John thirteen seventeen. Thou that you know these things, God will bless you for what? So I'd suggest if there is a lack of movement in your life around God, the Holy Spirit, ask yourself the question, what are you doing that you know you should do that you're not doing? How do you do, do you do? I don't know, that's just for comedic relief. 1 Corinthians 2.12, and we have received God's spirit, not the world's spirit, so we can know the wonderful things God has freely given us. I want to suggest this empowering of the Holy Spirit. We feel like he's absent because we are not focusing on the things that God has said, focus on these things and he will be there at hand to instruct you and lead you. Acts 5.32, we are witnesses of these things and so is the Holy Spirit who is given by God to those. Booyah. That's the, <laughs> that's the deal cleanser out there. People get frustrated because they think the Holy Spirit isn't moving. He's moving, but this over here 
is fundamental. It's not rocket science. You don't have to have a degree in theology. You don't have to be a subsonic, supernatural Christian. That one. That one. Really, I'm not trying to be facetious, but I honestly think guys like myself have stood up here and made this gospel so complicated that every human being feels that they have to do 50 courses before they can actually soar in Christ. And everything that I've preached to you this morning, 90% of the work is on him. Yours is submit, yours is obey, yours is do as I lead you. So if we're in a dance, which I wouldn't recommend you watch me do ever, is he leads and we follow. Verse 10, how I praise the Lord that you are concerned about me again. I know you have always been concerned for me, but you didn't have the chance to help me. Not that I was ever in need, for I have learned how to be content with whatever I have. I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. I've learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it is with a full stomach or empty, with plenty or little. For I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. Even so, you have done well to share with me in my present difficulty. As you know, you Philippians were the only ones who gave me financial help when I first brought you the good news and then traveled on from Macedonia. No other church did this. Even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent help more than once. I didn't say this because I want a gift from you. Rather, I want you to receive a reward for your kindness. At the moment, I have all I need and more. I am generously supplied with the gifts you sent me with Epaphroditus. They are a sweet-smelling sacrifice that is acceptable and pleasing to God. And this same God who takes care of me will supply all your needs from his glorious riches, which have been given to us in Christ Jesus. Now all glory to God our Father forever and ever. Amen. Give my greetings to each of God's holy people, all who belong to Christ Jesus. The brothers who are with me send you their greetings. And all the rest of God's people send you greetings too, especially those in Caesar's household. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. So there's two key things that I want to leave with you in this section. And the first one is gratitude is essential, is an essential attitude. It, it is the fundamental bedrock for a believer, because it's rooted in your justification. That while you were living in your misery and sin, when you were an enemy of God, he came to you by his loving kindness, opened your eyes, undeserved people, Keith and everybody else, I opened your eyes that you might know who is this incredible God, that you would be able to receive me and I would receive you because of the penalty, the death of my son for those sins. That my wrath that you would deserve it of in your generations and in your life, past, present, and future would be met by him fully and completely. So the essential space or place that we live from is first that whatever is happening in my life, I am now secure in him because he has secured me. And I can never be removed from that place. So whatever misery you've experienced, if we remove or we move right back to the very beginning, there is at least this. Your misery is only in this life and it endures only so much longer. But for all eternity, you have the privilege of being in him even from this very day. Although your circumstance, woohoo, yeah, amen. Even though your circumstance might not adjust, there is the ability to be secure and at peace because you are at peace with the one who is the peacemaker. 1 Thessalonians 5.18, be thankful. Now, would you say that this is something we should obey or it's more like a guideline or a suggestion or like God doesn't really know what your circumstance is or what you're going through right now? I would suggest that the Spirit of God who inspired this letter to be written, which that's what the Bible says, that the Word was written under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, He who was past, present, and future knows the end from the beginning because He is God, wrote this to encompass whatever scenario you and I face today or tomorrow. 
So I would suggest that it's all circumstance. For this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. Now, when that will is emphasized, you and I might have a past experience where somebody else's will is asserted in dominance and control, which has been at my expense. His is that when he suggests this, it's at his expense. As you do it, you will have life and life in abundance. Whenever God's will is asserted, know that it's always in our best interest. So the things that come to undermine this, envy. Believing that your life should be something else. If this person never did this, you would be in this much better place. I'm not suggesting that whatever that was, your feelings are not justified. But what I'm suggesting is because of that, there's an answer at the very beginning. That whatever comes on top of that is like manure. But what's under that is the seed of everlasting life. Choose that over the circumstance. Dissatisfaction. Dissatisfaction is a willful sowing towards a feeling or emotion about something that you believe you should have that you don't have. In marriages, in relationships, this is one of the single biggest destroyers. I would say, please surrender to God in this. Get the healing that you need. But there is no satisfaction that you will ever find in your partner, in your friendships, in your children, because it is reserved for him. And what you accidentally do is you make that person an idol. And what does God do with idols? He destroys them. So he won't destroy them because they're innocent of the worship you give them but you will experience death in yourself. And what is the answer for that? Here comes the good news. Confess, repent, so the times of healing and refreshing might come. Woo-hoo, those are pom-poms. God always has the outcome and the answer. Don't get stuck on the, on the, on the boo-hoo stuff. Go over to the yahoo stuff. A hard heart. A hard heart always speaks to me. Whenever I check a hard heart, is I believe I am right. And until that person does this, and then I go find the scriptures, and then my voice gets all pitchy. And it's not that you're wrong, but do do you want to be right or do you want to be righteous? Those two are very rarely aligning up. Because if I want to be right, then my flesh is big. If I want to be righteous, I can go low. So sometimes people say to me, how can you put up with this? And I just realize again that the scripture over here is, I'm not putting up with it. The person is leading to death. And what I hope to do is be on hand when the wheels come off. So that God can be met in that place. Because I believe that while we still have breath in our lungs, there's an opportunity for God to bring about redemption and a preferred future. It will take our response though. I don't prescribe to the fact that God will do anything while you and I are operating in pride. He says he resists them. I even had somebody come and try and say to me that it isn't like this or like this. But if you look at resist, resist is like, who knows who Ibn Etzebet is? Who would like Ibn Etzebet to resist them? A hundred and what's it, 26 kilograms of absolute prime beef. (laughs) A weapon of destruction to make sure that you do not get through. That is who you will face in a God-sized space when you operate in pride. He's got no time for that. For the only simple reason is God is not, um, he's not offended. He's God. And what he's saying is that when you operate in pride, you operate in the same spirit as Lucifer when he was thrown out of heaven. So if I will not contend with him, who I did not send my son to die for, how much more resistance will you face when you as my sons and daughters operate in the spirit that I threw out? The answer is humility and fear of the Lord. 
Then we start to see God unlock and release and things start to happen. That what you thought was going to be the end of you starts to become the place where in the manure something grows. So it says in Ephesians 4, 30, 32, and do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit. So this is very important, remember, because what I'm trying to paint a picture is how do we live free? How do we live in the fullness of God? It's saying here, when I mentioned that the Holy Spirit is assigned to us so that we might know what it is we to do, then we don't have that experience, so we have to take matters into our own hands, and then we believe there's some Holy Spirit, some me, now we get confused. Look what he's saying here. Do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. So when there's a sorrow in the way that we live, there cannot be a partnership because we've fallen out of agreement with God, and he will wait until we come into agreement before he will operate. Because the assignment of the Holy Spirit, by Jesus' words, is that he will speak to you about me, the things that are mine, and what is to come. So he's requiring us to make these adjustments. Remember, he has identified you as his own, guaranteeing that you will be saved on the day of redemption. Active word, do the following, so that it would not be our experience of what I described. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind to each other, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. Now, that is impossible to do, remember? I forgive you. So my first port of call is, get from God what I need, not a spa day. But you can go to this bar. The lastly, beware of idols. I've covered that a little bit. It is possible for a Bible believer, Bible carrying believer, Holy Spirit professing, all those titles, whatever, to have idols. And God doesn't contend with them and he will set his hand upon us in a way that it feels like we want to blame Satan, but it's him. Now, this is going to offend some of your theology, but I don't, really don't care because I'm not interested in yours. I'm interested in his because his brings us life. But I will give you scripture so that you can go home and argue with it and not with me. If you have a look at Jonah 2, 8 to 9, these are the confessing words of his mouth. Those who worship false gods turn their backs on all God's mercies. But I will offer sacrifices to you with songs of praise, and I will fulfill all my vows, for my salvation comes from the Lord alone. (laughs) Then, then the Lord ordered the fish to spit Jonah out of the beach. If you're trapped, if you're stuck, if you can't get breakthrough, I'd suggest that maybe you're having an experience like this. And he's going to keep you there until you surrender. Can I tell you why? Because God is concerned with your infinite value, not the value in this life. But what you do in this life sows to the infinite value also. And because they are together, you can't separate them. So the proving in us is in this life, not in the next life. So you see this for you and I, that you might feel like Satan's in your life, but I'd wanna suggest to you, maybe you need to go and say, God, is this you? So that I might surrender because you're safeguarding my life for all eternity. Because in this example, he is given an instruction. He is willfully disobeying. But here's the thing for you and I, is our obedience, I'd wanna suggest, is often justified because we're believing a truth we think is God's truth. So here is a man that knows what he must do, but he believes he knows better. He missions off. But again, the incredible beauty here is what does God do? He spits him out. And then he's with him again. 
Even though he did what he was asked of him, he grumbled the whole way through. God was still with him. He was obeying. He was doing. So this thing of idols, John Piper's got a saying. He says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Obviously, that's Psalms. But he adds it in his quote. I want to help those who are starting to see that conversion is the creation of new desires, not just new duties, new delights, not just new deeds, new treasures, not just new tasks. We like to find a sense of satisfaction in what we do. And this is the danger of good works, is good works is not the evidence of obedience. This is referring to the fact that when we are in love with God and we are adoring God, he is being worshipped and good works is being done. If you accidentally put God's good works first, you make an idol of the good works and you make an enemy of God. And you will see things happen in the natural. Keith, why is this so important to you? Because there's a warning around the end times that it says, even the elect will be deceived because they will not be able to discern between the spirits. And how is that possible? Because they will look in the natural, not perceive in the supernatural. So you must be able to discern the will of God by the Holy Spirit. Because we have an enemy that would want to bring divisive things to bring destruction. But the focus must be that there is this white hot worship. So check yourself with every good deed that you do. Who gets the worship? Is it those that we extend our hands to? Is it somebody that when they come and they pray with me and I see the freedom of God come upon them and I go, it was amazing. And then the next day I go into the meeting and nothing happens. That was a suck day. It's the evidence of where my worship is. Am I allowed to have a bad day because things didn't go well? Yes, of course. But then what do I do? Is I return to him and I say, but thank you, God, that the evidence of your love is not in the person's response. It's in you, my God. And I refresh my focus in him. Is that, that's very important. So that you might taste and see that the Lord is always good regardless of circumstance. So lastly, Acts 9.31. The church then had peace throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria. And it became stronger as the believers lived in the fear of the Lord and with the encouragement of the Holy Spirit. It also grew in numbers. So the very context that I was sharing about now, you see evidence in the scripture. It is not hands first, it's heart first. We do them simultaneously. It's not at the expense of one for the other, but it is something that as we do the works that God puts in our hands to do, I'm suggesting here that the scripture is putting towards a focus that's very important as we grow and advance in all the things that God gives us to do. God has said to me that, we will be very, very busy with the things of God. So for me, this is very important that we safeguard our hearts so that as we're building the things that God calls us to build, that the love and devotion remains fixed on him. Every single time we see history repeat itself throughout the Bible has not been in the, in the devotion of God's people to him. It's when accidentally devotion of things has become more important. Isn't that so? So I'll close with that. Maybe even you would want to respond in, in saying, God, I, I would want to reposition myself as somebody that has you front and center. That I have had a couple of idols. I have been living in a way that's disgruntled and unhappy. Maybe there's some of the attributes that I have allowed my mind to constantly be contaminated with ungodly things, bitternesses towards people. If you, would, if you would want us to lay hands on you and pray with you, we can do that. So if you would like to be prayed for this morning, why don't you come forward and I can, the team can pray for you. Because there's something in this journey It was highlighted when we were doing worship this morning is, do you know that you're a son and daughter of the Most High God? Do you experience that in your heart? 
Or is it just something that's in your, in your brain because you've read it on a piece of paper? And the way that that differs or changes is in our experience. And so you don't have to come forward this morning for this to be a reality. But there is something of this, that would you allow yourself to have God touch into your heart that you might have the experience as a son and daughter of the Most High God?